Man, it is exciting to be at First Wednesdays. It is my favorite. I love seeing what God is doing. Thank you so much for prioritizing prayer. God always moves when his people show up. It's amazing. Tonight, we're going to be in the final week in our Holy Spirit series. Each year for First Wednesdays, we pick a theme and then we kind of teach through that to add what God is wanting to do in our hearts throughout the year. And it was actually last, it was the summer before last, when me and Ashley, we took a week to go up to a, a church in Springfield, Missouri, that revival is stirring. And I just really honor the pastor there. And they do a prayer meeting and their prayer meetings actually um, probably runs about six or 7,000 people every week. And so I was like, I, what they're doing, I want a little bit of that for, to take that back home. And so we went up there and I was talking with their staff and team and they said that they had done a whole teaching around the subject of the Holy Spirit. And I had felt like the Lord was kind of leading me in that direction. And then I got home and I had a meeting with uh, Meredy, who's our spiritual care director. And I said, hey, I, I really think that um, God wants us to, to do something different next year. And I want to talk to you about it. And she said, hey, before you do that, I was praying and I felt like the Lord wants us to teach on the Holy Spirit. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I felt. And so we prayed about it. And then we set up the preaching calendar and we were going to spend the whole year on first Wednesdays, introducing our church to the person, to the presence and to the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you guys enjoyed learning about the Holy Spirit this year? And I believe God had us do it for a reason because I come from a charismatic Pentecostal background. Raise your hand if you were raised uh, charismatic or Pentecostal. Yeah, there we go. Raise both hands. Hallelujah. Glory, right? Should have bought a Honda, but instead you bought a Kia. I know, right? You're my people. Now raise your hand if you were raised more traditional Baptist or somewhere in between. I'm so proud y'all raised your hands in church. I really am. I just didn't think that you were going to do it, but you did it. You did it. Look, see that Holy Spirit series already wearing off on you guys. You got it. You got it. All right. Um, but what God's done throughout this is, is he has done just a, such an incredible work in our church. I mean, over and over again, we have just seen our, our church has grown by 49% this year. We've seen our giving go up. We've seen baptisms. We've seen salvations. We've seen marriages restored. Our small groups are increasing. Our serve team. We've had, you know, uh, 628 first time guests fill out connect cards this year. We've added about 150 people to our serve teams this year. I mean, it is amazing over and over and over and over again to see what God is doing. And I believe that a big portion of that is our willingness to introduce introduce and to invite the Holy Spirit to have his way in our church. And here's the reason why, because the Holy Spirit leads to healthy growth. This is what we're going to talk about tonight as we close out the series is we're going to talk about healthy growth. Not just, you know, not just because something grows doesn't mean it's always good, right? My kids are growing. That's amazing. I love it when things grow, flowers grow, trees grow, spiritually we grow, living things grow, but not everything that grows is good. There is unhealthy growth, cancer grows, bitterness grows, resentment grows. And so when we think about growing as a church, we don't want to grow any way. We want to grow God's way. And the way that God prescribes for a church to grow is found in the book of Acts, which we've been studying for the course of the year. And it's Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Essentially what Jesus is saying is, don't go out there and try to do this with your own intellect, with your own initiative, with your own agenda. Don't try to go do this unless you have this one special particular thing. And what was that thing? It wasn't a thing. It was a person. It was the third member of the Trinity. He says, don't try to do church without the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who brings healthy growth. And as a church, we don't want to grow at all costs. We want, to, we want to grow in such a way that God is glorified, that souls are reached. We want to grow in such a way that, that God prescribes his church to grow. And in order for us to do that, it's not me, it's not my winsomeness or my intellect or my amazing leadership ability or my charming good looks or my humor. It's not, it's not anything to do with me, trust me, because if you get to know our leadership team, it's me, Trevor, and Ethan, which is basically Larry, Curly, and Mo. Like, it's not on us, all right? 
it's, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to glorify God. And so that's the way that we want to see our church grow. And we actually see that happen early in the book of Acts. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the, the key to understanding healthy church growth, church relationships, the mission of God is the application and the invitation of the Holy Spirit in our church because the Holy Spirit leads to healthy growth. And so what they do at the very beginning is they have a prayer meeting. And for 10 days, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And then in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. The church explodes with massive growth and 3,000 people are added that day. It didn't come from Peter. It didn't come from James or John. It didn't come from some service that they held. No, it was when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They began to proclaim the good news and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. People heard it, they responded, and 3,000 people were baptized in a single day. Why? Because the Holy Spirit leads to a healthy growth. And we're gonna see what happens after that in Acts chapter two, verse 42. We're gonna pick up in the story here. And they devoted themselves. So here's where we're at. So Pentecost just happened. A move of God just swept through. 3,000 people were saved and baptized in a single day. The church comes to life and the gospel is preached and going forth. And they just have this amazing church service. Now what? What are they gonna do after that? I mean, how do you like beat 3,000 people getting baptized in a single day? Like that's a church service. Like I'm sure Peter had to take a nap after that, right? I mean, that's, that's more intense than preaching four sermons on a Sunday, right? So they have this massive, and they're all leaving and probably super stoked and they're really happy. They're like, could you believe it? And then Monday comes along. What do they do on Monday morning after Pentecost? What happens after that? Acts tells us what happens next. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and they were distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, they were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the last sermon in our Holy Spirit series. And so what I wanted to talk about today is what happens after an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What happens after Pentecost? How do we as a church maintain a move of God? How do we keep this spirit-filled emphasis and not just let this be another series and a long list of series and then we just move on to the next thing. Like, I want us to figure out what it looks like to truly apply this whole series to our, our church to where it becomes a part of our, our culture. And so what I wanna to talk to you tonight is about seven signs of a spirit-filled church. What do we look for when we are looking for a spirit-filled church? Now, I told you I grew up in a crazy, charismatic church, sometimes a little too crazy. We, we went off a little too much on the, 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 the cuckoo for charismania side. Like, we went a little too far sometimes. And others of you, you grew up where you've never heard teachings like this before, and so it's all brand new to you. Let me tell you a story about a church that was very similar to that. Um, it happened in the 1970s. My, my grandma told me this story. It's the church that she was a member of. And they, they were a first assembly of God and, and the church was, was growing and doing well. And then there was something called the charismatic renewal. And what happened is a lot of the traditional liturgical kind of mainline Protestant churches, they, people began leaving those going for more um, charismatic or more modern style churches. And as those people came into the church, what happened is the new people outnumbered the people who were already members. And it began to mess up the culture a little bit. And the pastor made a decision. What he decided is we're going to stop being spirit filled. So that way we can welcome in all of these new people without making them uncomfortable. 
And so then what they did is they changed the culture to reach the new people rather than reaching the new people and teaching the culture. And then within three years, that pastor was no longer there and the church died. And the reason is because they didn't teach people about the person of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do when our church is growing rapidly, and a lot of you are new and coming from different traditions and backgrounds, I want to teach you about the the person of the Holy Spirit so that way you can feel comfortable in our church and we don't want to lose who we are to be able to acclimate to the culture of this world. And so we're going to teach on the person of the Holy Spirit so you can get a better understanding of who he is and what a spirit-filled church looks like. And I know what many of you are thinking. You're like, but, but aren't those spirit-filled people weird? Listen, they're like, oh, all the charismatic people, they're so weird, right? I mean, they're always flags and banners and they're all like crazy and they're so weird. Well, listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't make people weird. The Holy Spirit makes you normal. Weird people would be weird with or without the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, there's just some people, they're just weird, right? See, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. The Holy Spirit makes you normal because what we read in the book of Acts, and we've been studying over the course of the year and here in the Holy Spirit series, is that a spirit-filled life is the normal Christian life. Jesus says, don't do this without the Holy Spirit." You need the Holy Spirit. You gotta have the Holy Spirit. In fact, the moment you become a Christian, God deposits the Spirit inside of you at the confession of your faith and you are indwelled by the Spirit of God. And so we cannot ignore the Spirit. We need to teach the Spirit, rely on the Spirit, be led of the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit if we wanna live the normal, authentic Christian life. It doesn't make you weird. The devil would try to lie to you so you're not living in the fullness of what God actually wants over you. That's why some of you are missing out on miracles. You're missing out on answers of prayer. You're missing out on opportunities for evangelism. That's why some of you, your, your friends and your coworkers, they're just begging for an opportunity to hear the gospel. But because you haven't been filled with the power, you don't have the strength or the courage to evangelize because you have been lacking in inviting the spirit of God to have his way in your life. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. The Holy Spirit doesn't make the church weird. No, what we see in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit is what makes the church the church. Because without the Holy Spirit, we're just a country club. We're just a goodwill organization. We're just another 501c3. It's what separates us from everything else because as a church, we are filled with the power and the purpose that the Holy Spirit gives to us. And so... The answer to bad teaching of the Holy Spirit is not no teaching of the Holy Spirit. That's what some of you would say. Well, why do we talk about that? Why do we talk about the Holy Spirit? Well, he's the third member of the Trinity. To ignore him is to ignore God. And so like the, the answer to bad teaching is not no teaching. The answer to bad teaching is biblical teaching. And so we want to teach it right so you can understand it, so you can enjoy a relationship, not with just God or Jesus, but having a relationship with the Holy Spirit because he is a person, not just a force. And he is important for the health of a church. And so what I wanna do is I wanna talk about seven signs of a spirit-filled church. Like how do you know that you're in a spirit-filled church? And and the Bible actually gives us these signs. Some of people would say the the sign of the spirit-filled church is speaking in tongues. The sign of a spirit-filled church is is, uh, prophecy. The sign of a spirit-filled church is everybody's running around like crazy people, right? Well, the, the spirit of God doesn't just make you run around. He also makes you sit down. He doesn't just make you speak in tongues. Sometimes he makes you hold your tongue, right? So what do we know? Because people can speak in tongues and still not have love. We already covered that. Though you speak in tongues of men and angels, but you have not love, then it profiteth nothing, right? 
And, and so what do we actually look for? How do we, what's the benchmarks? What's the signs of a spirit-filled church? Well, here's what happens after Pentecost. The book of Acts gives us seven things. I'm gonna move through them fast so we can get down into altars. The, the first thing is this, is an unwavering devotion. Look what it says. Here's a spirit-filled church. Right after Pentecost, they did not just go home and live their independent, autonomous life. I have a personal relationship with Jesus now. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. I don't have to do anything else while I'm here. That's what some Americans think. Yeah. I raise my hand and pray to prayer, walk the aisle. I'm saved. I'm, that means I don't have to do anything else for the rest of my life. That's not spirit-filled. Look what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and their prayers. People oftentimes say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, and I can have just as much of a relationship with God at home as I can in the community with other believers, and I don't need the church in order to, because I am the church. Listen, think about it like a relationship in a marriage. You don't have to ha go home to have a good marriage, but if you don't go home, you're probably not going to have a great marriage. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but if you don't, you're not going to be a strong one. The average American goes to church, the average Christian in America goes to church one out of four Sundays. They say that's, that's average. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem normal to me. That doesn't seem normal. Imagine if you only went to the bathroom one out of seven days a week. You wouldn't be normal, right? No, you need to get regulated. You need to get regular, right? And so church for us isn't optional, it's essential. It's essential in the, the, the early church, they devoted themselves to what we're doing right now. It was a priority for them. If the doors were open, they were there. If they had the opportunity to worship God, they didn't just stay home. They, they, they made it a plan and a priority for them to be gathered in the community of people, to worship, to celebrate, to praise God. It was a important, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread in prayers. Here's what we know is church is not optional. It is essential. It's essential for us to grow and to, to fulfill the great commission and to be able to experience everything that God has for us. It's essential for us. And so the answer for us is this, is, is keep showing up. And like, I know that, that's why we put it on the wall outside. We just wanna remind, hey, just keep showing up, keep showing up because the more you show up, the more you'll see God show off and the more you miss church, the less you begin to miss it. There was a devotion they had. Sundays, first Wednesdays, serve teams, membership, discipleship. It was a priority for them. Number two, there was an overwhelming awe and awe came upon every soul. When they left, they were like, can you believe what God did? Can you believe how amazing this is? How great that was? How good God is? Oh my gosh. Like God's truth, God's power, God's, God's presence, God's people. I love it. Like there was a, a awe, a, a wonder that came upon everyone. And I want for each one of us to have that attitude when we, when we think about church, when we come into the room, I want us to be in awe of what God is doing. Listen, I never want to take God's goodness for granted in my life. I never want to get to a place where I'm like, it's just another Sunday. It's just another prayer meeting. It's just another small group. Oh yeah, just, it's just another baptism. At the end of the sermon, pastor always gives people an opportunity to respond and two people raise their hands. Wow, last week it was four. But people can get that attitude because familiarity breeds contempt. And if you view church as checking off a box, you're always going to be frustrated and you're never going to be satisfied. Like, I never want to take God's goodness for granted. Uh, so my daughter, Ruth, she's four. And at the, at, after, at, after we give bath time, she always wants to play hide and seek. And not always. I told, made the joke Sunday. I didn't go find her. But most of the time, I do go find her. And she always hides in the same place. And I run over, and she has the blankets over her head. And I sneak up, and I go, boo, and I pull it off. It's the most hilarious thing in the world. Every single night we do the same thing and she hides in the same place and she is always so excited. Maybe we should think of ourselves like children of God. Yeah. Where we say, oh, God showed up again. He saw me again. Oh, his word was preached again. Oh, his presence was there again. Oh, somebody else got healed. Oh, somebody else raised their hands. Oh, there's another testimony. I'm so excited about what God is doing. I never want to take his goodness for granted in my life. Amen. Have an awe of your father in heaven. There was an undeniable proof and many 
Wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Our expectations determine what we see. They expected God to move, and guess what? God moved. And you know, for us in our society, there's a lot of pushback against the church and Christianity and the gospel. People want to argue about religion and about, you know, if God was so good, then why don't this and this and that? And people can argue all day long. But you know what they cannot argue with? Your testimony. Here's who I was. Here's what God did. And he did it for me, and I know he can do it for you. And we have testimony after testimony in our church of God moving. We have stories of, of, of healings, of miracles. We have stories of marriages restored. We have stories of, uh, of, uh, of addictions that have been broken. And so if you need a story, just listen to somebody else's. And it will build your faith for what God and what you're believing and trusting God to do next. And in order for us to do all of this, it doesn't come by our might, it doesn't come by our strength, it doesn't come by our power or how cunning we are, it comes through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because the Holy Spirit gives you access to a power that you don't possess. On your own, we can't do it. On our own, we can't explain enough. We can't achieve enough. We can't accomplish enough. In our own, we cannot give enough. We cannot serve enough. We will always fall short. But when the Spirit of God empowers you, he gives you gifts, he gives you abilities, he gives you a power that you couldn't possess. There is a a power in the church of the book of Acts. And I believe that one of the things that this world is lacking in is a church that has power because they can argue, they can debate, they can disagree with our doctrines, with our theology, but they cannot disagree with our testimony. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was broken, and then I was healed. I was hurting, and then God made me whole. There is a power in the Holy Spirit. It's an undeniable proof. What we see is that it was complete unity and all who believed they were together and they had all things in common. In 2,000 years, the church has never had anything in common since then. You ever been in a church? People argue about the littlest and dumbest things. Is that, does it really mean they had everything in common? Like everybody, you know, worked at Total and everybody wore Hey Dude shoes and everybody, you know, dressed in the same clothes and everybody voted for the same person and everybody listened to the same music. And does that mean that everybody had all things in common? No, that's not what it means. what What it means here is they had a unity about them. It means that they were able to set aside their preference for a greater purpose. Okay, in an American individualized culture, this is really challenging because in America, if you don't like something, you just leave. If you don't like your cell phone plan, you just switch cell phone companies because there's no commitment, everything's a contract. Yeah. And if you don't like what you see on TV, you just change the channel. If you don't like what you're watching on Instagram, you leave a nasty comment and then you move over to the next one, right? <laughs> because in the American culture, it's all about me. In the church, it's all about we. The church world, you put the needs of the church before the needs of the self. And this is really difficult for Americans to grasp. But just so you know, the Bible was not written in American. (laughs) Just like the church, right? Either either we assimilate people into a biblical culture. The the Bible assumes that they're that people will set aside their, their preferences. What, what are preferences people have? A, a, preference, a preference isn't a bad thing. Like we all have our preferences, right? But when we're gathered together, we have to set aside our preferences for a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. And so in our church, there's people, I can't make everybody happy. I tried, it didn't work. So for some people, we're too Baptist for the Pentecostals and we're too Pentecostal for the Baptists. And then they get upset. Right? They're like, he preaches the Bible, but he speaks in tongues. I don't know what to do with that. And then others are like, he speaks in tongues, but he preaches the Bible. What happened? Right? And some people are like, like oh, I want, I want, I need, we need gender-specific ministries. We need a single ministry. And then others are like, we need all generations gathered together for wisdom. 
And then some people are like, I wish I had a life group. And now we have small groups. And some people like small groups. And they don't like life groups. And some people think it's too hot. And other people think it's too cold. And, you know, I mean, and why don't we have a body has their preference. The music's too loud. The music's not loud enough. The sermon's too long. The sermon's not long enough. And, and we all come from other churches or other backgrounds and with expectations. But sometimes when you come into a new church, you, you know, the worship's not my favorite, but my kids love it. You know, maybe it's too loud, but I'm going to put headphones in because I love the baptisms that never run dry. Like, like I'm going to lay aside my, you know, I have preferences too. And I don't just control everything that happens in this church. Like there's things we do as a church. I, I would prefer that we didn't do them. Do you know that? I'm not in the meetings that our team runs. And so sometimes they do things. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't do it that way, but you know what? They're growing as leaders and you guys love it and y'all think I came up with it. So, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> but as a, as, as a leader, even me, I have to lay aside my preferences yeah. and I have, to, I have to put the need of the church above the need of myself. Yeah. And that's what a unity is. And so sometimes we just have to say, you know what? Just like in marriage, like, I don't like that they do that, but I do love them. And so I'm just gonna, they say, you know, when you get married, you go into marriage, you know, uh, love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener, right? And so, and then when you get married, you're just gonna have to learn to close one eye, you know? It's just like, <laughs> you gotta set aside your, your preferences. Number five, outrageous generosity. They were selling their possessions and belongings and they distribute the proceeds to all who had need. What they're showing is that a spirit-filled church is outrageously generous. Yes. See, Jesus gives the Holy Spirit, and then spirit-filled believers give in generosity. Yes. We've received the Spirit, and so the Spirit says, I want you to give. I want you to bless. I want you to be generous. I want you to be above and beyond outrageously generous. So they were selling their possessions. And then the next section, we see that Barnabas sold a field and brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. An outrageous generosity. I've never met a spirit-filled person who didn't like giving. This is why as a church, when we're doing Heart for the House, we're doing Multiply, here, here's what I always say. I say, you go ask God what you are to give. Right. I, I say that all the time. I say, hey, don't let me give you a number. I believe 10% is, is a good rule of thumb that the Bible teaches. I believe in tithing. I tithe. But I believe that when we ask God what should we give, he's always going to try to tell us to give more than we can afford. <laughs> because he wants for us to trust in him as our provider. And so I, I, I love it. We had a story just this week for Heart for the House. And I was like, hey, why don't you talk to your spouse, talk to God and let God tell you what to give. And, and she came up to me and she said, pastor, you wouldn't believe it. This week, I thought of a number and, my, and I went to go talk to my husband and my husband had the same exact number. I was like, that's God. That's totally a God thing because most men can't count, right? And they, <laughs> they came up with the same number. Like, I gotta take off my shoes to get to 20, okay? And so, and so I just listened to my wife most of the time because, she, so anyway, so, um, <laughs> so they had the same number. And then I said, I'm gonna give you just a couple of moments to pray and ask, ask the Holy Spirit one more time. Is this, is this what you want me to give? And she turned and she looked at her husband and her husband turned and looked at her and said, God told me to double it. Yeah. Here's, the, here's, the, here's the testimony. That's not the testimony. Here's the testimony. For over th 40 years, this couple's been married and her husband never came to church with her until he started coming to redemption last year. Yeah. He got baptized in our church, saved in our church. And the whole 40 years they've been married, he never allowed her to give to the church, period. He said, you're not allowed to give. I won't let you give. Don't give to the church. And so she would sneak a little money here and there that she had access to, and she would, she would give because she was spirit-filled. She loved giving. But she also loved her husband, and she wanted to honor him. And so whenever the husband said, the Holy Spirit said, double it, that's the testimony. Amen. That's the testimony. Here's what I always say. Giving is not about the size. It's about the sacrifice. Yes. For some people, $100 is too much. For some people, $100 isn't nearly enough. For, for some people, 
just saying the word $10,000, you automatically are like, oh. For some of you, you make that in a week. And that's not generous. The Holy Spirit is the one who tells us what generosity is. And so when we give, it's not about the size of our gift. It's about the, the sacrifice of the giver. And when we trust the Holy Spirit to lead us in our generosity, he will always lead us into areas that we have to depend on him. Number six, authentic community. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. Look what it says. It says, on Sunday mornings between nine and 11 o'clock, they gathered together to, and prayed. Is that what it says? What, what was the rhythm of the early church? How often did they meet? Once a quarter? Once a week? Day by day. The way we say it here is this, life change doesn't happen in the lobby, it happens in the living room. Like if you really wanna experience life change, it's gotta go beyond a Sunday morning. Amen. The life of the church happened after Pentecost. It didn't happen in the upper room, it happened in the living room. And as a church, we gotta get out of this, I go to church, I check off the box, I have my holy moment, and then I go to work and raise my kids and I try to make it through the, through the week. No, 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 we gotta get out of that mindset. Church is not just a checkbox that we do and we try to fit it into our schedule when we can do it as if we have achieved some holy status on behalf of God. That's just the beginning. That's just the surface of what God wants to do in your life. He doesn't want us to have just a Sunday to Sunday experience Experience. He wants his church, a spirit-filled church, is a day by day. It is life change on a Sunday and on a Monday and on a Tuesday morning text with your friends. It is a Wednesday night small group. It's playing bunko on Friday nights. That's where life change happens in the health of a church. And so if you are only coming on Sundays and this is your first Wednesday, we love you. We're glad that you're here. You are on a journey of life change and what God is doing and it's just the beginning and I couldn't be more excited for you to take that next step and getting involved and plugged into the life of a church because life change doesn't happen on, in the lobby. If you think you've experienced life change and you've only come on a Sunday, baby, you get ready because there is more in store for you when you enter into real community. And our seventh and final point is God-sized growth. What happens when we live a life of devotion and awe, when we have an undeniable proof, complete unity, outrageous generosity, authentic community? What happens when we live out as a spirit-filled church? What, what is the end result? God-sized growth. Why? Because the Holy Spirit leads to healthy growth. Look what it says. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Why? Because the Holy Spirit leads to healthy growth. Not all growth is good, but godly growth is. And we want our church to grow in a way that is godly. We want to grow in a way to where He gets the glory and not us. And some people think, well, are you just all about the numbers? Is church all about the numbers? Well, when it comes to plundering heaven and uh, plundering hell and populating heaven, yeah, I am about the numbers. Jesus left the 99 for the one. What does that mean? He counted. He knew how many people and how many sheep he knows. And so the number matters. Why? Because every number has a name and every name has a story and every story matters to God. 3,000 people were added in a single day. You know what that means? Somebody had a clicker in the back counting. 
One more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. And that's our prayer every single week. God, give us one more. Give us one more soul. Give us one more service. Give us one more missionary. Give us one more building. Give us one more church planted. Give us one more leader. Give us one more marriage. Give us one more testimony. Give us one more salvation. Give us one more miracle. Give us one more healing. Give us one more every single week. All we want to see. It's one more. Give us one more. It's the growth that God brings to a church because the Holy Spirit brings about healthy growth. And so here's how I put it in your notes as we, as we close. The spiritual growth leads to numerical growth. We're not focused on the numbers focused on the names, the stories, the people who walk through the doors of this church. And we believe that if we help people grow spiritually, then numerically, God will take care of the rest. We just want to see people healthy. We want to see people whole. We want to see people filled with the Holy Spirit as they give their lives to Jesus. And when we focus on the the spiritual growth, I believe God's going to take care of the numerical growth. And so right now, I'm going to cast a little vision of where we're heading next year as a church because we're at the end of the Holy Spirit series. So you're wondering what comes next? Well, what comes next is we're gonna focus in 2024 on spiritual growth. I don't know if you know this, we're out of room and I'm really not looking forward to adding a fifth service until we get to the new building. We can drop down to two, but we don't have any extra room. At our 11 o'clock, it was so packed. We put chairs out, people are starting to leave again. So if you could come to the 8 a.m., that would mean a lot to us. But what we wanna focus on is the spiritual growth of our church, because I believe God's gonna bring the numerical growth in the new building and it's gonna happen. But we wanna go really deep so we can grow really wide as a church. And so next year for First Wednesdays, here's the direction we're heading. We're starting a new series called Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People. And so we're gonna focus on how do we grow in our relationship with God when we all live such busy lives. And so we're gonna walk through every month a different spiritual discipline and we're gonna give you a a practice, a take home. We're gonna give you a resource that month to go along with it. And so in January, we're kicking it off with fasting. How many of you love fasting? How many of you love fast food? (laughs) Well, you're gonna be fasting food for 21 days and I'm gonna give you a, a, a fasting guide with prayer points for us as an entire church to learn how to fast and guided fasting. And then in the month of February, we're gonna do um, a series through prayer and we're gonna be guided prayer points so we can all be praying through the same thing. But it's a series on spiritual disciplines for ordinary people. And so here's what I'm super excited about is out of 12 weeks, I will only preach three of the messages. And we have raised up a preaching team of trustees and elders and ordinary people in our church, like Bob Balch, who will be preaching. Because what I want you to see is that as the pastor of this church, I'm committed to raising up leaders, to giving people opportunities. But more importantly, I want you to see that I'm not any more special than you. I want you to see that you can have spiritual growth in your life. And so I've asked men and women who I see it in their life to come and share what they do how they grow in their relationship so we as a church can all grow deeper in our relationship as well. Why? Because the Holy Spirit leads to healthy growth. Can I give it up for God's word? Come on. So here's how we're going to close as a church. If we could all stand together, we're going to move into our altar moment and our prayer time. This is not dismissal yet, but I want to give an opportunity for response. You've heard the message, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird, He makes you normal. You sat through 12 weeks of Spirit-filled teaching, we're Spirit-filled people. And so what I wanna do right now, in our prayer meeting this morning, we had a word that went out that God wants to tear down the wall of fear, of shame. He wants to tear down the wall that is preventing you from receiving everything that God has for you. Some of you, you have a wall built up towards the Holy Spirit. 
You're saying, oh, he makes people weird. I don't want to be like that. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to make you weird. He wants to make you normal tonight. And so if you would like to receive a fresh touch from God, if you would like to receive an infilling of the Spirit, an outpouring of His love, or even just to receive a hug from somebody on our prayer team to let you know that God has never forsaken or abandoned you. Our prayer team's up here, and I wanna open the altars for people to get a fresh touch from God tonight as He tears down those walls. I want you to know the water is fine. Don't just dip your toe in the water of the gospel. Jump in from the deep end. He will not let you drown. The water's fine. So our prayer team's up here on the front. The altars are open. As people respond, I want us to be praying together over them right now. Heavenly Father, I pray.